Hello, welcome to basics of noise and its measurement. Today is the last day of this uh, course and we will capture two small but important concepts. One is uh, reverb chamber and the other uh, topic which we are going to discuss today is how do we use a reverb chamber to measure absorption coefficient of uh, general materials. So that is what we are going to discuss. What you are seeing here is and the source of this is this website as this is a picture of a reverberant room and this is just the opposite of an anechoic chamber. So in an anechoic chamber your whole approach is to make sure that there is as little as possible there are as uh, the amount of echoes or reverberations are as small as possible. In reverberant room what you want is just exactly the opposite. You want that if a sound hits the wall it gets reflected to the maximum possible extent. Okay. So in an anechoic chamber you are actually uh, having theoretically zero reverberant time and in an ideal reverberant chamber you would have a very long reverberant time running into several seconds. Okay. And uh, so this is the picture of a reverberant chamber couple of things about reverberant chambers. First thing is that their walls and doors and all the surfaces which to which uh, sound strikes they are extremely hard. They are extremely hard and you try to make them as hard and as rigid as possible. So whenever sound hits it comes back and it does not get absorbed a whole lot. So that is the first thing. Second thing is an important consideration while you are designing reverberant chambers is that the noise or the sound in the reverberant chamber should be diffuse and isotropic. What does that mean? That if I measure the sound pressure level at point A, I then I go to another point, then I go to a third point, then I go to a fourth point. If the my design is perfect then all the measurements of these sound pressure levels will be same in magnitude and in their spectral content. Okay. So this is a very important requirement. So you ensure that reverberations keep on happening by making sure that all the reflecting surfaces are very uh, hard. A lot of times people use granite uh, surfaces for these reflections. But to make sure that the field is diffuse that is a very tricky thing to uh, achieve. And uh, there are several considerations or uh, several uh, guidelines which you uh, follow to make sure that that happens. So first thing is that if it is just a rectangular room there will be natural modes of the room you know and that will generate standing waves. And once you have standing waves what that will mean is that there will be pressure high pressure at some point and low pressure at some other point you know there will be nulls and peaks at different points. So you do not want to have any standing modes in the room. And the first level uh, to achieve this is that you make sure that all the walls in the reverberant chambers they are not mutually parallel. They are at some inclined arbitrary you know some uh, not random angles but they are not parallel to each other. So the modes do not develop very easily that is one thing. The second thing is that you not only have straight reflecting surfaces or flat reflecting surfaces but you also make sure that sound gets reflected not only at specific angles but whenever it hits a surface it gets reflected in several directions at the same time. Okay. Now if I have flat surface and sound comes and hits it angle of incidence will be same as angle of reflection. So it will go in a particular direction but I do not want that to happen. So what I also do in a reverberant chamber is that at several locations I put a curved surface okay. and these types of curved surface uh, reflecting surfaces are known as diffusers. So when sound hits these diffusers it spreads out and it gets diffused. It is not like a focused beam but it gets diffused and it uh, gets spread uh, evenly into the whole thing. So that is another way to achieve a good reverberant chamber and uh, through uh, these uh, diffusers. And then there are uh, some other uh, tricks 
to achieve this in addition to that uh, because we want that the sound field should be diffused and it should be isotropic which means that at every location the sound pressure level has to be the same otherwise I will not know where to measure take the measurements I, I will not know where to take the measurement because at some lo location measurements will be more some location measurements will be less and I will get con I won't be sure what's happening so this is one thing the other thing to make sure uh, that uh, this diffusion of sound happens in the whole field is that people have so suppose you have the room like this and then people have big panels like this now this is a small rectangle but they have very large panels and these panels act as reflecting surfaces and they are hooked to the ceiling and then they rotate slowly like this so sound when it hits them uh, it gets reflected at all sorts of angles because sound is bouncing off all the time and each time it hits it's hitting them at a different angle and sometimes they also put diffusers on these so that it, this is like a mixer you know it's like a mixer where you have a lot of material and you are mixing it and you make sure that the whole sound is getting mixed and it is getting mixed uniformly and it is spread uniformly in the whole room so that is exactly the concept so this is like a mixer not an audio mixer but a mixie which you use in our houses you have several ingredients and it mixes and it mixes things uniformly so this is uh, another concept which uh, approach which people use to make sure that sound is isotropic in uh, the reverb chamber so these are some of the uh, methods and this is the picture of a particular reverb chamber and what you see here is if I am interpreting this correctly see these are all hard flat surfaces and these are all diffusers and uh, and then there may be some other diffusing elements also in this thing and uh, this is what makes sure and then once you have done the design of the room and you have constructed the room then the way you have to characterize the room correctly so you have to make sure that you take measurements at different points in the room and if you have done your job correctly then the response of the room at all the points should be similar so if it is pretty close to each other then your uh, room is not only reverberant but it is also truly isotropic so then you have a uh, good room to use for your experiments so like an echoic chamber a reverberant chamber is also a tool in the toolkit of an acoustics engineer so uh, an echoic chamber is used to characterize the directionality of a sound sound source or a noise source and also to measure and characterize a particular noise source and things like that a lot of times reverberant chambers are used to measure absorption coefficients of materials for which we do not know the value of alpha okay so we have discussed how to measure alpha earlier also by using an impedance tube right so uh, what does an impedance tube give it gives us the value of z which is the impedance and I know that the value of that z is uh, uh, dependent on reflection coefficient right and from that I also I can calculate the value of absorption because whatever is being not whatever is not being reflected that is getting absorbed uh, we can also use these reverberant chambers to measure alpha for different materials and how do we do that is what we will discuss this in next uh, several minutes so suppose you have a reverberant chamber and if there is nothing in the room it's just an empty room it will have some room constant right so let's call this t1 uh, not room constant it's the uh, reverb time for the chamber so this is equal to 55 v over a prime c and t1 is the reverb time for a reverb chamber which has nothing in it so that is t1 and it's a prime is a1 okay now we know that so I can measure this so t1 can be measured okay I can measure the value of t1 okay once I can measure the value of a1 I can find 
given prime, I can determine it right from this formula. If T1 is known, V is known, C is known, then I can calculate A1 prime, okay. And this is equal to S times natural log of 1 minus alpha bar, okay. So I know, so once I know this A1 prime, I can calculate alpha 1 bar because S is what? Is the internal surface area of the reverb room. So this can be calculated. Okay. So alpha 1 has been calculated. Now I can assume that my room, it all the reflecting surfaces, I can I can assume that it's they have similar uh, reflection characteristics. So all the values of alpha 1, alpha 2, see this alpha 1 bar was what? Alpha 1 S1 plus alpha 2 S2, right? So I can also and then divided by S, I can also say that all these alphas are some average value, you know. So, so so this alpha 1 alpha because all of these walls will be made of similar materials because uh, we do not have chairs and sofas and all these things everything is very hard. So, so I know this alpha of different reflecting surfaces. So I am at this stage. Now the next thing which I do is I take a big piece of material whose alpha is not known and I put that in the reverb chamber. Then with that material I find T2, A2 prime C and times V. So V is still the same, T2 I have measured, C is still the same and I have measured T2 so I calculate A2 prime and from this I calculate alpha 2 bar, okay. I calculate alpha 2 bar. So what is alpha 2 bar? Alpha 2 bar is alpha 1 S1 plus there are all the surfaces but then there will be one surface where, uh, huh. so if there is say alpha i, i surface and here S i minus area of the material plus all other terms divided by S plus uh, what is there plus alpha alpha unknown times A right. So I know all the terms in this equation. I know all the terms in the equation because I have un initially assumed that alpha and alpha 1, alpha 2 are same. I mean this is an approximation but if you can, if you know individual specific alphas then that is even better. And then see because you know all the values of alphas except alpha unknown, this is also known. You can back calculate, you can calculate the absorption coefficient for the material with unknown value and this will again change with frequency. So it will change from frequency to frequency. So you have to be careful about that. Now there is a more detailed procedure for all of this. So there are ISO standards. So you can look at some of these ISO international standards organization and they will help you exactly figure out how this measurement has to be done. So that is what I wanted to discuss in context of reverberant materials. So what you have learnt in this class is what are reverberant rooms and uh, what kind of uh, material, uh, I mean you can use these rooms to characterize uh, absorption coefficients of materials with uh, uh, of different materials and that brings us to the closure of this course. 
over this eight week period i think we have uh, hopefully it should have been helpful to you we have covered a slew of topics we started with the wave equation then we solved it then we went to transmission line equation from transmission line equation then we started discussing different measurement techniques different ways to measure impedance we discussed different types of microphones what kind of microphones are good for what kind of applications what makes a good microphone for uh, from the standpoint of taking measurements then we also learned how to analyze sound and noise signals so fft and then uh, discrete uh, fourier transform and then we also learned uh, quite a bit about short term discrete fourier transform and also this spectrograms so you learned a whole lot of techniques and uh, i hope you had a productive course and i thank you for all the patience for uh, these 8 uh, weeks and please let us know if you have any feedback thank you and best wishes for your future bye